built on seven hills along the Moskva River, Russia's capital, Moscow. A mega city bearing the stamp of Russian history like no other. A perpetual magnet for people from the near and far. My name is Anton Wilhelm Nordhoff. As a doctor, I'm really supposed to be treating the Russian nobility, but Moscow is on the point of destruction. The focus of the country, Moscow, the starting point for the exploration and conquest of a whole continent. Siberia. What wide open spaces. Just what I want. My name's Eugen Zabel, and I'm the first German to use the Trans-Siberian Railway. Yeah! Red Moscow, capital of world communism, the destination of hundreds of thousands of people fleeing from danger. But with what outcome? My name's Wilhelm Marsmann. I'm searching for a free and just world. My name's Irena, I'm his wife, and I followed him to the Soviet Union with our children. A city burns. Old Moscow was in flames. A German doctor witnessed the disaster. For days, more and more Muscovites had been fleeing the city, threatened as it is by war and occupation. Some inhabitants did not survive the attempt to get out. But this girl was lucky. A passerby gave her first aid. Anton Wilhelm Nordhoff, born near Osnabrück in northwest Germany, was 34 years old. After studying medicine in Jena, Erfurt and Göttingen, he made his way to Moscow in 1809. He was enticed by a lucrative offer of the post of personal physician to the Russian prince. The enemy is getting closer and closer to Borodino and the town of Mosheisk. Concern in Moscow is growing fast. All the streets are full of refugees whose carts have to avoid others loaded with the wounded. For the German doctor, the stay in far off and exotic Moscow was supposed to be a profitable challenge. But now the city was on the edge of the abyss. And it was all down to one man. Napoleon Bonaparte. As the 19th century dawned, the French emperor was master of much of Europe. And in the summer of 1812, he launched an attack on his last great opponent on the continent, Tsar Alexander I. Since Napoleon's invasion, the Russian army had avoided a set-piece battle. Instead, it had constantly retreated, abandoning the land to the invader. But at Borodino, a good hundred kilometers from Moscow, a decisive battle was finally fought. On the 7th of September, Napoleon gave his troops the order to attack. The battle of Borodino lasted into the late evening. It was to go down in history as the bloodiest battle of the 19th century, with almost 100,000 dead. It left Russia weakened and the way was open for Napoleon to march on Moscow. It was here that he wanted to overwinter with his army. He had little choice. The winter would be harsh. The outcome of Borodino was not immediately apparent in nearby Moscow. Communications were confused. 
but the mood in the population was becoming more and more hostile to Western foreigners. The German doctor Anton Willem Nordhoff had to fear for his life, and the French hadn't even arrived. In times of war, like now, foreigners in Moscow aroused deep suspicion. The people were afraid of betrayal. Anyone who stands still in the street is a spy. The people attack him, maltreat him, and drag him off to the police, beating him as they go. Every ruffian abuses passing foreigners with insults. French dog, spy. He has to keep his silence or he'll be beaten up. And then Napoleon was at the gates of Moscow, the legendary city, the heart of Russia, surrendered without a fight. The allegedly immeasurable riches of Russia had been promised by Napoleon to his soldiers as booty. But no one came to receive him, or, as etiquette demanded, to hand the keys of the city over to the victor. For Napoleon, the series of unpleasant surprises continue. This war was no longer going according to plan. An important eyewitness to the events that followed was the German doctor Anton Nortov, who remained in Moscow in spite of the danger. His original notes survive. Kept carefully by the family, they describe in detail what he saw. Nortov realized that soon after Napoleon's entry, Fires were started in many corners of the city. Soon the center was in flames which quickly spread. A controversial key figure in Nordhoff's notes too was the city governor Count Fyodor Rostopchin. Long in advance he'd drawn up a secret and crazy plan. He assembled a gang of unscrupulous arsonists. His aim was to deny Napoleon the triumph of seizing holy Moscow, even if it meant destroying the city with thousands of dead. Anton Wilhelm Nordhoff watched the fires being set. All the prisoners, murderers and thieves, rogues and robbers were released on condition they carried out this great patriotic duty. They were to set fire to every corner of the city. And so Moscow burned. For days the fires raged, destroying countless churches and palaces and killing numerous inhabitants. The Great Fire of Moscow was a turning point in Russian and European history. It marked the beginning of the end of the Napoleonic Empire. For a long time it was unclear who had started the fire. Was it looting French soldiers or fleeing Russians? For many, the guilty men were Napoleon and his troops. For many, they still are. But the actual fire raiser, Count Rostopchin, could gloat. His murderous and unscrupulous plan paid off. With the destruction of Moscow, Napoleon had nowhere to overwinter. Retreating through the snow and bitter cold, he lost more than half of his once so glorious army. For the German ruling families, the burning of Moscow was the signal for further battles and the wars of liberation. And so it was a milestone in German history too. With a great deal of luck, Anton Willem Nordhoff escaped the blazing inferno and its consequences. But he was not destined to return to Germany. In 1825, aged just 46, he died while on a trip to the town of Oriol in central Russia. Moscow today, rich in sights. Everything seems huge. Moscow is growing by the day. The flood of new arrivals looks endless. As on islands of peace, between great thoroughfares, the historic legacy of temporal and spiritual power lives quietly on. 
but otherwise the city threatens to suffocate. Russia's heart is also the heart of the country's rail network. There are nine main stations, with travelers departing for every corner of the huge country. To this day, the railway is Russia's logistical backbone. This is what Moscow looked like at the start of the 20th century. But even 50 years before that, the watchword was change. The peasants had finally been liberated from centuries of serfdom. Industrialization was underway, and for that Russia needed a modern form of transport in order to access the wide open, largely unknown territories beyond the Urals. The Trans-Siberian Railway from Vladivostok in the Far East, a 9,300-kilometer band of steel advanced across steppe, taiga and tundra, across the Urals, the geographical border of Europe, all the way to Moscow. A German with a great wanderlust is saying goodbye to his friends. The journalist and travel writer Eugen Zabel, born in East Prussia. Evgeny, warten Sie mal. Bitte. According to Russian custom, a departure must be accompanied by a certain ritual. Bitte. Wofür soll das gut sein? Zabel wondered what it was all about, but a friend explained. One has to sit down and say nothing for a few moments. That ensures you'll come back in one piece. Gute Reise. Vielen Dank. Herzlichen Dank für alles. Ever since 52-year-old Sabel had heard of the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railway, he wanted to experience it. He was the first German to do so, an early lover and explorer of Russia. To travel across two-thirds of Europe and all of Asia in two weeks, there is something hypnotic and fantastically exciting about that. No one can deny that a new hour has struck for world travel. The railway was a prestige project of the Russian ruling family. When work started in 1891, Tsar Alexander III proclaimed, it will be a wonder of the modern world. The model for the Romanovs was the American railway that had opened up the Wild West. Each year an average of 600 kilometers was laid across Siberia. Russia urgently needed the railway for its modernization and economic development. Siberia, a wild, wide-open territory. The railway was designed to bring it closer to the great Russian cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg. These endless spaces were a source of deep contentment for many city dwellers. Even from distant Germany. The bridge over the Yenisei is without a doubt the most beautiful of all those that cross the Siberian rivers. In six mighty arches this proud structure spans a river which rushes so headlong that huge icebreakers have to be fitted to its granite pillars. Such technical challenges were often only met with the forced labor of convicts working under the worst conditions. They saw nothing of the freedom of the open spaces. Some prisons in major Russian cities were almost empty because the railway swallowed up more and more workers. But there were plenty more where they came from, as Russia was becoming increasingly reactionary under Alexander III. 
he oppressed his people mercilessly, setting up a huge police state, particularly since the assassination of his father by left-wing revolutionaries. The importance of the Trans-Siberian Railway grew rapidly. The young Tsar Nicholas II gave his German wife an expensive present in 1900. A Fabergé egg, with the root of the railway engraved on its inside, and a miniature train with a platinum engine and golden coaches. The rear lights were diamonds. The rearmost coach is fashioned as an orthodox chapel. In reality, not everything that glittered in 1903 was gold. Early morning on Eugen Sabel's route. On the 15th day of the trip, he had reached Lake Baikal. Here, the passengers had to change trains. In front of us stood an iron and steel monster of huge proportions, from which projected four wide, smoke-blackened chimneys. Lake Baikal, the Earth's oldest and deepest lake. This was the most difficult engineering stretch on the route. The trains had to be shipped across the huge lake on two large railway ferries, built in England at the Armstrong Works in Newcastle. Their countless individual components were shipped by sea and rail to Lake Baikal, where it took a year to assemble them. The ferries were designed to double as icebreakers to maintain the rail connection for 10 months a year. But from February to April, the ice was so thick that not even the latest technology could break a channel through it. So Lake Baikal was still the eye of a needle in 1903 when Sabal passed through. The southern bypass was the technically most demanding and most expensive stretch on the whole route. Construction work on it had only just begun. And on his return to Moscow too, Eugen Sabel had to trust the ferry across Lake Baikal, but that gave all the more time for his travel notes on what was still a very adventurous trip. His observations of his first journey on the Trans-Siberian Railway were a bestseller when they were published in Germany. The exotic East was enticing. Eugen Sabel, the man with the itchy feet and a taste for Russia, died in Berlin in 1925. The Kremlin, the heart and germ cell of today's metropolis. For centuries, the seat of the Grand Dukes of Muscovy and the Tsars of Russia. The great epoch-making upheaval in Russian history, the October Revolution of 1917, did not begin here though. The Bolsheviks seized power in St. Petersburg the Russian capital since the time of Peter the Great. But Lenin, the leader of the revolution, moved the government to Moscow without much discussion in 1918. The stout walls of the Kremlin promised greater protection in the event of a counter-revolution. And so Moscow became the Russian capital again after two centuries. And after almost three years of bloody civil war, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was officially inaugurated here in the Kremlin in 1922. Moscow was now the undisputed number one in the huge empire 
which was far more than just Russia. Red Square, then and now, Moscow's greatest tourist attraction and the daily route to work for the powers that be in the Kremlin. When the revolutionary leader Lenin died in 1924, his embalmed corpse was put on public display in Red Square, where it can still be viewed in the mausoleum. He was succeeded by his comrade-in-arms Joseph Stalin, who extended his rule over the country ever more ruthlessly and brutally in the following years. A summer afternoon in the Russian provinces. Irene Maasman was the daughter of a brewing family from the Rhineland. She was returning from a shopping trip. She had been living here 200 kilometers east of Moscow for five years together with her husband Wilhelm and her children Stefan and Susanna. Wilhelm, what is going on? I'm going to Irene, stell dir vor, die Radioübertragung vom Nordpol geht gleich los. Ticho. Сейчас. Это должна быть правильная станция. Their new life in the Soviet Union had not turned out as they had first imagined it would. Wilhelm Maßmann came from Mecklenburg in northeast Germany. He had met Irena at the School of Applied Arts in Munich. After she had completed her studies in textile design, they married and soon had children. The slump of 1929 had thrown them out of work, and like tens of thousands of other Germans in the next few years, they went to work in the Soviet Union. They were full of hope for employment and for a life less full of care. After arriving in Moscow, the Marsmans and their children landed up in Taikovo, a small industrial town. In the local textile factory, they found work in the drawing offers, a friendly and committed couple with a profound faith in communism. Outwardly, the Soviet Union presented an impressive image in the 1930s. Huge construction sites bore witness to rapid industrialization. Signs and technology were dominated by the pressure to break records. Soviet pilots made the first non-stop flights to California. On their return, they were fated. For the first time, Soviet scientists landed an aircraft at the North Pole. The members of this expedition drifted around on the pack ice for months, maintaining only radio contact with Moscow. Radio was the fastest medium available, and so millions of Russians became ear witnesses. It was an uplifting moment for Wilhelm Maßmann, who by now was a member of the Communist Party. But at the same time, there were dark forebodings. Das ist Technik. Ein wahres Wunder. For in 1937, the Soviet Union was in reality one huge prison camp. The economic successes were often the result of forced labor. The Gulag was spreading its tentacles over the country. Millions of people were doing back-breaking work in subhuman conditions to build socialism. Few had had a fair trial. The man responsible was the omnipresent party boss Joseph Stalin. He and his clique lived in constant fear of treachery and revolt. Potential opponents and dissidents were to be eliminated forever. The leadership stoked up a hysteria in the population against sabotage and espionage. In short trials, leading party comrades were condemned to death. An unparalleled purge began, reaching into the highest circles of the Soviet elite. In July 1937, Stalin and the Politburo 
unanimously adopted Secret Service Plan 00047. It gave the orders for a gigantic wave of arrests. Exact quotas were laid down for every region and every town. Those arbitrarily arrested were to be divided into two categories, eight to ten years in a labor camp or death by shooting. On the 17th of September 1937, Wilhelm Maßmann was arrested. He'd been walking home from work as usual when agents of the NKVD, the secret police, dragged him off. Maßmann's arrest was meticulously recorded in his party dossier along with the reason. He was a fascist, a spy and a counter-revolutionary. At the factory he had, it was said, drawn swastikas on the cloth patterns. The investigators had secured the alleged proof. For three months, Irene Maßmann sought desperately for her husband. It was as if the earth had swallowed him up. There was no news of him. She turned to German party comrades in Moscow, all to no avail. So. This involved trips away from home. Before leaving, she gave instructions to her children about who to go to in an emergency. She left money for groceries on the table and said she'd be back the next evening. Stefan, auf dem Tisch liegt etwas Geld für Essen, wenn ihr was braucht. Ich pass schon auf, aber bitte sei vorsichtig, Mama. Ich hab euch lieb. Deckt euch zu und macht das Licht aus. What she didn't tell the children was that she'd been summoned to the local offices of the secret police the next day. Irene Maßmann had no idea that a further purge was underway in the Soviet Union. Order number 00039 was directed against foreigners, including the Germans in the country. Most of them were to be arrested as spies, agents and terrorists. Irene Maßmann did not return from the local headquarters of the secret police next day. Instead, they came to collect her children. The neighbor, Aunt Xenia, as they called her, knew better than to ask questions. The fate of the Maßmanns was typical of millions in the years of Stalin's great terror. Thousands of Germans were also affected. And it's only because of the German bureaucratic mentality that we know about the Marsman story. From the files of the German embassy in Moscow, now archived in Berlin. After Irena's disappearance, her brother, a car mechanic in Essen, sounded the alarm. He turned up at the foreign ministry put his foot down and even wrote to Hitler's Reich Chancellery with a plea for help. A letter from the Soviet authorities arrived in the German embassy in Moscow. Wilhelm Maßmann had evidently become mentally disturbed while under arrest. He kept hearing voices. Finally, the Soviet Union deported him. On the 19th of March 1938, he arrived back in Germany, totally confused and without his family. But what had happened to Irene and the children? The last photographs showed Stefan and Susanne on an outing in the Russian countryside. Because their uncle Fritz Berger wouldn't give up, the German foreign ministry finally reacted. An embassy official in Moscow was dispatched to find the Marsmans. Johann Königseder, who spoke fluent Russian, drove to the textile factory where the couple had last worked. The director of the factory had also been arrested. Nor was there anyone else in the place who remembered Frau Marsmann. There seemed to have been very extensive arrests. I moved on from the factory to the Marsmann's apartment. 
There too, I could unfortunately only find out that there was no one living in the house any longer who knew the Marsmans. In addition, the people seemed to be in such fear that it was impossible for me to get them to say much. Jessica Doma? Just one old woman was willing to talk to him, Aunt Xenia, the neighbor who often babysat for the children. Who are you then? I'm from the German embassy in Moscow. My name's Koenigsader. Okay, come in, but don't shout. Aunt Xenia had more information. After their parents' disappearance, Stefan and Susanna had been sent to a children's home near Stalingrad, nearly a thousand kilometers away. She even showed the German diplomat letters the children had sent her from there. Now the German embassy formally stepped in and demanded that the Soviet foreign ministry hand the children over to the German authorities. It was an unusual affair. The negotiations went on for weeks, but at last the children were placed in the custody of the embassy. At the start of 1939, the German ambassador Count von der Schulenburg personally returned Stefan and Susanne to their father in Königsberg. But there had been no trace of Irina Maßmann for more than a year. It was only in June 1940 that the Soviet Foreign Ministry sent a brief message to the effect that Irina Maßmann had died in prison on the 20th of January 1938, just a month after her arrest. No course of death was given. The Great Terror in the Soviet Union was one of the greatest human disasters of the 20th century. 700,000 people were murdered in the course of one year alone. They are commemorated by a simple memorial stone next to the headquarters of the secret police in Moscow. And Irina Maßmann? Not until 2001 did the Russian prosecutor general release more information regarding her fate. At the request of a German historian, she had been sentenced to death by shooting on account of alleged espionage and fascist agitation. 25 years after the execution in December 1963, a military tribunal in Moscow had secretly quashed the judgment. The reason? No crime had been committed. Moscow in the 21st century, the capital and financial magnet of the country, home to 11 and a half million people. The great majority, young and old alike, are united by one thing, victory in the great patriotic war, as the Second World War is known here commemorating the battles that raged 70 years ago is still of enormous importance for Russian national pride. Moscow's fate hung in the balance. In 1941, German troops had advanced to the outskirts of the city. But less than four years later, Stalin and the Soviet Union could celebrate a triumph. A triumph won at huge cost. At least 27 million dead Soviet soldiers and civilians. And a new war was just beginning. The Cold War. The potential dangers were even greater. The Soviet Union and the United States were threatening each other with total nuclear annihilation. This time he had gone too far. His daily drive to the Institute took a totally different route. The Soviet leadership had finally had enough of Andrei Sakharov. 
20 years earlier he'd been fated by their political leadership. He was the youngest member of the Academy of Sciences, a winner of the Stalin Prize, a hero of socialist labor. His name was not made public abroad. He had created weapons which allowed the Soviet Union to catch up with the United States. Nuclear physicist Sakharov was the chief constructor of the Soviet atomic bomb. In 1961, his designs led to the building and detonation of the world's most powerful hydrogen bomb ever, shortly after the Berlin Wall was built at the height of the Cold War. Politicians and military chiefs saw the test as a great success. But for Andrei Sakharov, it was a wake-up call. A frightful crime against humanity had been committed, and I could not prevent it. It was probably the most terrible lesson of my life. One cannot serve two masters. The nuclear physicist realized the implications of nuclear fallout. According to his calculations, each megaton of explosive power would result in 10,000 future death. But the Soviet nuclear testing continued. From now on, in the eyes of the Kremlin, Sakharov was off message. In the next few years, he became one of his country's leading critics. A dissident who for years publicly protested about the arrest of friends and other opposition figures and who agitated for the rule of law. For his work on human rights in the Soviet Union, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975, but was not allowed to go to the ceremony. His wife and comrade-in-arms, Yelena Bonner, accepted the prize on his behalf in Oslo. A few years later, the Red Army invaded Afghanistan. Moscow supported the communist leadership in its southern neighbor and conducted a brutal campaign. Sakharov was appalled by the aggression. In interviews with German and American newspapers, he demanded the immediate withdrawal of the Soviet troops, and he suggested how the West might apply pressure Moscow was preparing for the 1980 Olympics and seeking to show its best side. Sakharov called for a boycott and struck a very sensitive nerve. The United States followed his suggestion. Withdrawal from Afghanistan within a month, they said, or no games. Sakharov had long since been public enemy number one, but now he had gone a step too far. His own country now withdrew him from circulation. The prosecutor general personally expelled him from Moscow. He was forbidden all contact with Westerners. Along with his wife, Sakharov, the human rights activists, had reached a low point banished as in Zara's days to a city close to foreigners, Gorky, silenced for an indefinite period. The only pictures we have of these Sakharovs in these years are surveillance photos taken by the secret police. They lived in a small flat without a telephone. They were forbidden to travel. The police and the KGB kept a constant watch. A man forbidden contact with the outside world is said to become a living corpse. That this did not happen to me in Gorky, I owe only to my wife. Andrei Sakharov protested against these conditions by going on hunger strike. The powers that be sought to hush this up. They distributed photos in the West purporting to show Sakharov in good health. But while these pictures went round the world, the one-time leading scientist was being brutally force-fed.
It took the arrival of Mikhail Gorbachev in the Kremlin to bring about a change. On the 23rd of December 1986, Sakharov arrived by train in Moscow. It was a moving reception. Gorbachev had now definitively lifted the exile. Zakharov could continue his fight for human rights. I shall write and talk as long as my strength holds, for it is their destiny and my destiny. The Soviet people were now experiencing Gorbachev's new policies of glasnost and perestroika, openness and restructuring, and in his home city of Moscow, Andrei Sakharov was campaigning for freedom and democracy. His courageous appearances in the Soviet parliament were watched throughout the country. Sessions were now broadcast live, a result of perestroika. For Gorbachev and many others, Sakharov's plain speaking in parliament took some getting used to. When challenged by Gorbachev to respect the rules of the parliament, Sakharov replied that he did respect them, but above all he respected the people listening to him and humanity generally. But his tireless commitment was finally too much for him. On the 14th of December 1989, Andrei Sakharov died of a heart attack to the immense grief of his compatriots. For Andrei Sakharov, the Soviet Union was always his home, even though in the end he became one of the most vehement critics of the ruling clique. He did not live to see the end of the Red Empire just two years later. After a failed coup by communist hardliners against President Gorbachev, it was impossible to keep the Soviet republics together. On the 26th of December 1991, the Soviet Union was officially dissolved. Since then, Russia has once again been just Russia, or, to be precise, the Russian Federation. And Moscow? The pulsating capital on the Moskva River is today a colorful place with a great history. Moscow remains Moscow, the driving force behind the biggest country on earth, with the restless rhythm of a gigantic cosmopolitan city. <laughs>